السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين uh, Welcome everybody back to our Ramadan series uh, Living with Prophet Yusuf Inshallah ta'ala uh, Today will be uh, lesson number five And so um, as you can see yesterday uh it got really intense um really intense yesterday uh and hopefully inshallah as we move forward we'll begin to process you know everything that happened so yesterday we left off with um uh ayat uh ayat number 13 sword 12 ayat number 13 where prophet yusuf alayhi salam uh, excuse me, Prophet Yaqub, his brother, his sons came to him asking him permission to take Yusuf out. And um, Prophet Yaqub is trying to appeal to their their sensitivity, which they had none. And he said to them, "Inni la yahzununi and tadhabu bi," that it 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 pains me, you know, it grieves me that you should take my son and you you should go. And as we said. From this, the lesson, uh, which I believe was lesson number 13, lesson number 13, and that is that a parent's, you know, a parent's love is expressed through fear. When a parent is in fear of their child, that's the parent basically expressing the love for their child. All right. And so Prophet Yaqub said to his sons, you know, inni la yahzununi and tadhabu bi, that it, it grieves me, it pains me that you would take Yusuf from me and you would take him and you would go. And he said, and I khafu ayyakullahu dhib wa antum anhu ghafilun. And I fear that a wolf will eat him while you are heedless of him. All right. And then the sons they retorted with uh, what they believed was confirmation uh, of their ability to protect Yusuf. And they said, you know, if you know, in ekalahu dhib wa nahnu usba, that if a, a, a wolf was to eat him while we are large in number then we would be literally, you know, lost, you know. And so then Prophet Yaqub made them take an oath. They take an oath. You can take him, but I want you to take an oath that you're going to protect him, you're going to feed him, and you're going to bring him back to me safely. They took an oath from Prophet Yaqub. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ And then when they left out of the eyesight of Prophet Yaqub, they began beating on him. They begin beating him. They begin punching on him. This is, we're talking about a seven-year-old boy. The scholars mentioned that Yusuf alayhi salam was between seven to eight years old at the time that this incident happened. We're talking about a seven, eight-year-old boy who is being brutalized, being beat by his own brothers. Ten boys, ten boys beating up and punching on him and beating on him all the way until they get to the well. They tie his hands behind his back and they tie the rope around his waist and they lower him down into the well. They will lower him down into a well. Uh, some narrations mention that Yusuf was holding on to the well with his hands and they took stones and they hit the fingertips of Yusuf so that he couldn't hold on to the well and they lowered him down, right? They lowered him all the way down. Into the bottom of the well. There's no water down there. There's no light down there. And they removed his shirt. All right. They took his shirt off of him. And they beat him. Right. And they tied a rope around him. And they lowered him down into the bottom of the well. All right. And I want you to imagine this. Just imagine if you had a child at seven years old, eight years old. I want you to imagine your child, you know, being at the bottom of a well with no shirt on. Battered and bruised up from his own brothers. Right. And then, you know, one narration mentioned that Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam, he started pleading with his oldest brother, the oldest brother, the one, the same one who told them, don't kill Yusuf. And a caller from amongst them, a speaker from amongst them, who was the oldest child, said, don't kill Yusuf. So Yusuf thought that he could appeal to the oldest boy because it seemed like he had some level of sympathy. It seemed like the oldest boy had some level of sympathy. So Yusuf is pleading with the oldest boy, I'm your brother, Ana Akhik, I'm your brother. You know, Irhamni, Warham Ba'fi, 
you know, have mercy on me. Have mercy upon my vulnerability, upon my weakness. You know, I can't do anything. You guys are older than me. You're bigger than me. There's nothing I can do to you. Have mercy upon me. And the oldest boy, pay attention to this. The oldest brother, Latamahu, smacked him. Latamahu, Latman Shadida, smacked Yusuf. And he said to Yusuf, La qaraba baini wa bainak al There is no kinship. There's no ties of kinship between me and you today. We're not brothers. We're not brothers today. He said, Fedu Ashamsa wal Kamara wa ahada ashra kaukaban to anis to anisuka to anisuka. He said, Why don't you in the bottom of that well pay attention? This is the oldest brother talking to Yusuf as he's about to lower him down into the well, right? He said, I'm your brother. We're brothers. Don't do this to me. And the oldest brother said to him, We're not brothers. Smacked him in his face and said, We're not brothers today. There's no karaba, there's no kinship, no ties of kinship between me and you today. He said, and at the bottom of the well, why don't you call on the moon, the sun, and the moon, and the 11 stars to be your friend at the bottom of the well, to assist you, to accompany you at the bottom of the well. Subhanallah al-Azim. So that means that they found out about the dream. Subhanallah, they found out. He said, why don't you call on the moon and the sun and the 11 stars at the bottom of the well to come and assist you at the bottom of the well? SubhanAllah. Man, they, they found out. No narration that I have ever come across has ever talked about how they found out. Nonetheless, they found out. Right? This was their hik, their hasid, their envy and their hatred for Yusuf. Right? Meaning, they were already envious of Yusuf, but when they found out about the dream, it only exacerbated their animosity. It exacerbated their hatred for him, right? Maybe, I don't, I don't know, the, no narration that I've ever come across has mentioned how they found out. Nonetheless, this statement lets us know that they found out about the dream. And there was no mercy for Yusuf, right? And pain, pain has a deeper psychological effect when it comes from the people that you love. Pain that is imposed on you, right? The, the pain that is imposed on you by somebody who is a complete stranger is pain nonetheless. But when it happens to you from somebody that you love, it's, it's even worse. All right. But envy knows no friends, no family, no familiarity. When you are envious of an individual, you don't see. Right. You don't see anything. And then, of course, the next ayah, we come to the next ayah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we're on ayat number 16. Ayat number 16. So they drop Yusuf in the, bat, uh, the bottom of the well. Uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said, Annahum thumma innahum dhabahu sakhlatan wa ja'alu damaha ala qamisi Yusuf. So then the brothers, they went and they slaughtered a lamb. They, they slaughtered an animal and they put the blood on Yusuf's shirt. This is why they took the shirt off of him, Right? They took the shirt off of him and they splattered the blood all over the shirt. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And then they came to the father at night crying. Pay attention to the ayah. A lot of jewels in this one as well. All right. And they came to their father at night weeping. They came to their father Isha. Yani filayl at night time. Why did they wait tonight? This incident happened during the day. Why did they wait to nighttime to come to Prophet Yaqub crying, right? And they said, um, and they said, oh, our father, we left with Yusuf and we went to go play. We went to go race and we went to go play. And we left Yusuf to guard over our stuff while we were playing. And a wolf ate him. A wolf ate him. 
And we know that you're not going to believe us, even if we are telling you the truth, right? Sounds very convincing, right? Sounds very convincing, right? You're not going to believe us, even if we are telling you the truth. Let me give you a lesson here. Some of the scholars, they have a line, a method, al-Arabi. You know, the, these are like, um, these are like Arab, you know, Arab phrases, right? Um, idioms, if you, ha if you will, right? And they said, the scholars, they say, لا تطلبوا الحاجة بالليل فإن الحي في العينين. Do never, never ask someone for something at night. Always ask during the day where the day has eyes. And the scholars, they have another saying, النهار له عينين. That the, the day has two eyes. The night has nothing. And if you notice, they came to Prophet Yaqub, Isha'a Yabkun. They came to Prophet Yaqub at night. Why did they come at night? The scholars, they say that النهار له عينين. That the, the, the day has two eyes. <laughs> The day has two eyes. And if you ask somebody for something that you need, never ask at night. It's Abe. In certain cultures, in Arab culture, it is Abe. It is something that is embarrassing for you to ask for something at night because it seems like, you know, there's a, you know, there's a ploy. There's a plot. There's, there's something else. There's an agenda behind it. Why are you waiting tonight, right? And the reason why they waited into nighttime is because at night, they were hoping that they would gain a little bit more. They, it would be more convincing for them at night. They're crying. They have a bloody shirt. It's nighttime. Keep in mind, there wasn't electricity as we have today. They were using candles, right? A candle inside of a niche, right? All right? They have, they're using candles. So it's not like they have, you know, lights where we can see during that time. All they had was candles. So if you're coming to somebody with tears, you know, that's coming down your cheek, it, it looks like your cheeks are wet. It looks like you're really crying and you got a bloody shirt and it, it looks like the, you know, so it looks like the truth is with you. It looks like that you are actually telling the truth. So it's, it's more convincing. So this is, you know, shaitan is playing with them the whole entire time, right? And keep in mind, these were not real tears. In Arabic, there's something called, you know, al-buka and tabaka. Ya tabaka, meaning that you are fake crying. You are forcing the cry. And buka is like real tears, real tears. But what they were, what they were doing was falsifying tears. It wasn't real. Because some people think that if they add a few tears to the situation, then, you know, it's for aesthetics purposes, right? To, you know, kind of embellish the story. You want to make the story look real, then shed a few tears. All right? Shed a few tears if you wanted the story to look real. All right? And the lesson here, this is lesson number, uh, lesson number 15 for you guys. Lesson number 15 here. And that is something that uh, Imam Al-Qurtubi mentioned in his tafsir. He said, هذه الآية دليل على أن البكاء يعني بكاء المرء لا يدل على صدق مقالته لاحتمال أن يكون تصنعا. Lesson number 15. Imam Al-Qurtubi, he said, قال علماؤنا, our scholars, they say, our scholars say that this verse that they came to Yaqub crying, this verse is proof that tears are not evidence, are not proof that what a person is saying is true. And this is especially true for imams, students of knowledge, when you have women that are coming to you and they're crying, they're giving you this whole story about how the husband is not giving them their rights, how the husband is oppressing them. And I'm not saying that there is not some truth to it. Obviously, shaitan can take a, a 99 lies and mix it with one truth. I'm not saying that there's no truth to it. But what I am saying is that you as a wise man, you as a smart man, have to understand that what the narrative that she is giving you is only one side of the narrative. It's only one side of the narrative. Something Brother Hassan said to me some time ago, uh, Hassan said to me, he said, when somebody starts to talk to me, 
automatically I already calculate 65% of what they're saying is, is not true. 65% from the door, from the rip, 65% of what you're saying is bull, you know, bull spit. 65% of what you're saying, the moment you open your mouth, I've already taken 65% of it out. That is not the truth. That is not the truth. Lesson number 14 was that the silver lining, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always your silver lining in the darkest of circumstances and situations. Number 14 was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is your silver lining in the darkest of situations. Number 15 is that tears are not proof that a person is telling the truth. Tears are not proof that the person is telling the truth. A sister comes into the imam's office and she's crying. Her niqab is wet. You know, she's crying. Her hijab is wet. And the imam, you're sold on whatever narration she tells you, you're sold. You're sold just on the fact that she's, she's shedding tears. And this is not the truth. We see right here that the brothers of Yusuf were, were shedding tears as they were telling Prophet Yaqub the story. And they were straight liars. Absolute liars. All right? So I want you guys to pay attention. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I don't care if a woman is offended by it. I mean, the truth is the truth. I'm not, I'm not here to placate anybody's feelings. If, if you are offended by me saying that not every person that is crying or telling a story, that they're telling the truth, if you are offended by that, then, you know, I'm sorry. I, there's nothing. I, I'm not a... I'm not apologizing for what I said. I'm apologizing for the fact that you are offended by something that is actually the truth. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not apologizing for what I said. I didn't actually say it. The scholar said it. I just concur. <laughs> I concur. And, and I mean, I, and I've been in that situation. I've been an imam before. I've been in, in, in the imam's seat, sitting in my office, and I get a knock at my door, and a sister opens the door, and her niqab is wet, and she's crying, and you're like, sister, come on, have a seat. She immediately won you over, just with the tears. She immediately won you over, just with the tears alone, for someone who is not paying attention. So what the scholars are saying here is just because someone is crying does not mean that their narrative is haq. Does not mean that what they are saying is true. Look at, you need to look no further than the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Sometimes the tears could be just because she's upset. I'm not saying that she's embellishing her narrative because she's crying. She could be upset. She could be hurt, but just because you're hurt doesn't mean that you are in the right. How many times have somebody thought that they were in the right and they're hurt and they're upset and they come to someone and someone says, no, nah, that's, you know, let me give you another way of looking at it. Here again, a prisoner of your own thoughts. Don't be a prisoner of your own thoughts. You might think that you are in the right. And then when you go and you sit with someone and they say, no, let me give you another way of looking at that. No, 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 no. That's that's not that's not what it is. And then you explain and then the person is like, wow, I never even looked at it like that. So I'm not saying that the tears are not real. The tears might be real. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The tears might be real, but the tears are not evidence that what the person is saying is true. You guys following me? I'm not saying that the tears are not real. Obviously, in the case of the brothers of Yusuf, the tears were not real. Right? The tears are not real. But I'm saying that if a sister comes to an imam and she's crying, the tears might be real, but the tears are not sole evidence that what is coming out of her mouth is the truth. And some men are just, you know, ready to rescue. That's that's our nature as men. We want to be rescuers. We like to rescue. Some men get a thrill out of rescuing, just like some women get a get a thrill out of a project. You know what I mean? You're a man. You take the dustiest, rustiest, raggediest dude that you can find because you like a project. I'm going to build this man up. I'm going to invest all of myself into this man. I'm going to build him up and I'm going to make him, you know, some of some of you women, you like that. That's where you derive your validation from. 
the, about the amount of men that you build, the amount of men that you build up because you like a project. And then when you're done with him, you go find another project. Because you're constantly seeking validation from external instead of seeking validation from internal. So just like some women love a project, some men love to be a rescuer. I did a whole series on this called the, the man logic and the woman's intuition. I did a whole series on this. Man logic. Men love to rescue. We love to play Superman. And just because we hear, we just because we hear, uh, you know, see a woman crying doesn't mean that what she's saying is the truth. All right. So that's your lesson number fifteen. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wajau ala qamisihi bidamin kadib," and they brought, they brought a shirt. They brought Yusuf's shirt, right? They brought Yusuf's shirt and it had blood on it. Bidem and kedib. Allah says, Bidem kedib. Falsified blood. This was not Yusuf's blood. Waja'u ala qamisihi bidem and kedib. Right? And they. Um, So uh, let me just say that if you would like to remain on the live, then I, I, would res I would hope that you would be respectful. If this is your first time on the live and you're not, you don't familiar with who I am or whatever, I think you should go and do some research first. But if you come on my live and you are disrespectful, you will be blocked. No questions asked. And that might not mean anything to you, but it means a whole lot to me and everybody else is listening. <laughs> okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, moving on to the next ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 18, Surah 12, ayah 18. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءُوا عَلَىٰ قَمِيسِهِ بِدَمٍ كَذِبٍ And they brought Yusuf's, they brought Yusuf's shirt, they brought Yusuf's shirt, بِدَمٍ كَذِبٍ With falsified blood, right? Falsified blood. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ And Prophet Ya'qub took one look at the shirt and he knew that it wasn't, the story was not what they, what they said it was. How did, how did Ya'qub know that they were lying? Because number one, they use the same lie, they, they use as their lie, the same thing that Prophet Yaqub said to them from the door. What did he say to them? I'm pained or grieved that you would take my son and go. And I fear that a wolf will eat him. That's what, that was his fear. So in their minds, they're saying, oh, we can use that as the excuse. We can use that as the excuse, right? This is how a person takes what you say, twist it and turn it and use it for their own. And this is what some people used to do with the scholars. I'm, I'm not sure if they still do it. I'm pretty sure they probably still do it. That's the only way they maintain their relevance. But you have some people who do that with the scholars, right? The scholars will say something and then they will take what the scholars say and they will twist it until it suits them, right? They do the same exact thing with the scholars of Islam. They'll go to the sheikh and they'll say, sheikh, you know, there's a brother who says this, who says that. And the sheikh will say, well, uh, you know, as, according to what I know, the sheikh might leave a little bit of room showing that he doesn't really know the whole entire situation. And what do they do? They'll take the sheikh's, scholar, the st the sheikh's statement and then they'll come back and they'll, you know, put it out in front of everybody. Oh, the sheikh said this and the sheikh said, that's not what the sheikh said. That's not what he said. Prophet Yaqub, he said to them at the beginning that I fear that a wolf will eat him. They said, oh, we can, we can use that as the excuse. So they came back. Number one, yes, Yaqub was already apprehensive. He already was, you know, <laughs> he was already uh, apprehensive about them. Number one, he already had his, you know, parental intuition. He already had his parental intuition, number one. Number two, uh, they came back using the same excuse. How ironic. 
How convenient. A, a wolf ate him? Isn't that the same thing I told you I was afraid of? And so they thought that we're going to play on it because this was something he was already afraid of. But what they didn't know is that how ironic would that be that you come back and say he got eaten by a wolf and that was the same fear that Prophet Yaqub told you he had from the door. Mm, I'm sorry, this just doesn't line up completely. Number three, Prophet Yaqub looked at them and he could tell these are his children, that there's not real tears. Your tobacco, they're, they're fake crying. Your falsified tears, it's not real tears. Number four, is that when he looked at the shirt, he looked at the shirt and he said, there's no way that this shirt belonged to my son because if a wolf had eaten my son, there would have been holes in the shirt. Prophet Yaqub, in one narration, it was mentioned that he said, Ma arham had the dhib ala ibni. How merciful was this wolf to my son that he didn't even shred his skin? He didn't bite him? <laughs> he didn't rip the shirt? How merciful, <laughs> right? This is how parents, like, you know, when you're being sarcastic with your children because you can see straight through their lies. Yaqub said, how merciful was the wolf to my son that he didn't even shred his skin? He didn't rip the shirt up? And this shows you, they forgot to rip the shirt up. And this shows you that human beings are flawed by nature. We are flawed by nature. We will always leave evidence. We will always leave clues when we have done something wrong. How do you think people get caught? All the time. You always leave a clue. A piece of your hair was there, so they found some hair at the evidence. Piece of your nail, something happened, and they always catch you. Always. <laughs> Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, created the human being as such is that the only way that we can live in peace is when we live morally, honestly, truthfully. You don't have nothing to hide. <laughs> when you're honest, you have nothing to hide. Lying is unnatural, which is why lie detectors, they can tell, they can tell when you're lying because your pulse starts to rise, your blood pressure rises, you know, your body temperature changes because it's unnatural. Not to mention when you lie, you give off a certain energy. And men who cheat on their wives have to understand that. Men who marry other wives without telling their wives, how long do you think it'll be before your wife finds out? How long do you think you're going to carry on this charade before your wife finds out? <laughs> your wife can tell that something is wrong by way of your energy. Your energy is off. The moment you walk in the house, because human beings, we give off energy. <laughs> your wife knows your energy. She lives with you. She sees you every day. She embraces your energy every day. <laughs> you don't think that your wife is going to pick up that something is wrong? Every single time, never fails. Never fails. Ask any brother. <laughs> never fails. Even if your wife doesn't confront you, even if she doesn't confront you, in the back of her mind, she knows. She knows that something is different about you. She knows that something is different about you. Every single time. Which is why it, it only pays, right? It only pays to be honest. Lying is unnatural. Your whole mood change, your body change, your body language change, your facial expression changes, your energy changes because it has to match the lie, which is unnatural. So your body, everything is doing what is unnatural to match what is unnatural, which is the lie. The lie is unnatural. So your mood, your body language, your facial expression, your energy, everything has to change to match the lie. Whereas when you're telling the truth, you don't have to go through all of those changes because it's natural. It's natural. And most men do tell on themselves and they don't even realize it. You thinking that you a player, not realizing that this is a woman who lives with you. She knows your energy. All right. So they uh, lying is not natural. It requires energy to lie. All right. And this brings us to lesson number 16. Lesson number 16, what is done in the dark will always come to the light. What is done in the dark will always come to the light. 
Yaqub salam he knew. He said, Bel sawalat lakum anfusukum amra. He said, rather, this is something that you guys have concocted. This is some type of plot or agenda that you have concocted for sabrun jamil. And for me, I'm just going to have a beautiful patience. Beautiful patience. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked, "What is sabrun jamil? What is a beautiful patience?" I'm not going to just be patient. I'm going to exercise the most beautiful form of patience. What is beautiful patience? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked, "Ma sabru jamil? What is beautiful patience?" The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "A sabru jamil, a sabra bila shakwa." A beautiful patience is patience that is exercised without complaint. I complain to no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously. As Yaqub said himself, Inna ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah. I only complain of my grief and my sorrow only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the scholars explain that complaining to Allah does not infringe on patience. Complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not infringe on on you being patient but complaining to others about Allah is the antithesis to patience it is the antithesis right to patience so Yaqub said bal sawalat lakum anfusukum amra but rather this is something that your own souls have done for sabrun jamil and only for me at this point is Beautiful patience, because I don't know the details, but I do know in time, God reveals everything. And that's a fact. That's your lesson number, number 15. The lesson number 16 is that what is done in the dark will always come to the light. What is done in the dark will always come to the light. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one, one of his names is what? Al-Haq, the truth. And that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the truth. And that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be in favor of the truth. Allah will always aid and support the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always make a way and create opportunities for the truth to come out. Look at 9-11. When 9-11 happened, we, the American people, during the time of that tragic event of 9-11, we were no different than Prophet Yaqub. We knew that it was a lie, but we didn't know the facts or the details. So all we had to do was just be patient. And what happened? Over time, within the next year or two, everything was exposed. Everything that was done in the dark, all of the plotting, all of the scheming, all of the agenda, everything that was done eventually came to the surface. And so, what will happen with the COVID-19? Everything, all you got to do is give it a year or two, everything will expose itself. Right now, we just sit and we wait. Sabrun Jamil, beautiful patience. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-haq. We know God is the truth and we know God loves the truth. We know God supports the truth. We know God exposes the truth. One of Allah's names is al-kashif. Kashif al haq Allah will expose the truth. In due time. Everything in due time. Some of us want the truth right now, so we opt for what seems to be the truth. Because we don't want to wait. Our minds can't handle just waiting in this place until all of the facts come and it's exposed. Some of us can't handle that. We don't exercise that type of patience. We don't have that type of patience. So we want immediate results. So we go after what is apparent, what the majority is doing, because that feels good. That gives us some sense of relaxation mentally. It gives us mental relaxation because this is what everybody is doing, so it must be the truth. But all you got to do is give it some time. Some of us can't wait. Some of us can't sit in this place because it's too uncomfortable. It's too uncomfortable sitting in the unknown, right? It's too uncomfortable to sit in the unknown. I, as you get older, I am at a place in my life where I am totally comfortable sitting in the unknown until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes everything. 
But some people can't handle that. They need immediate results and they will go with the majority. They will go with, you know, what seems to be what everybody is talking about. What You know, just because they want to be at ease mentally. Because they can't sit in that space and just wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expose it. You got to sit and wait. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that Allah's name is Al-Haq. Allah is the truth. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Kashif. Allah will, is the exposer of all things. And we know that everything that is done in the dark will eventually come to the light. When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was being accused of adultery... There was no way for her to clear her name. Aisha, in that narration, she said, I used to cry. I would wake up, cry, go to sleep. Wake up, cry, go to sleep. <laughs> I, there was nothing that I could do in that situation. There's nothing that I could do. Just imagine somebody is tarnishing your honor and there's nothing that you can do about that. You got to sit in that discomfort. And in that time that you're sitting in that discomfort, you are in a privileged place. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِيَّاكَ وَدَّعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ وَإِنْ كَانَ كَافِرًا فَلَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ hijab. I caution you against the dua of the oppressed person because there's nothing that stops the dua of the oppressed person from being responded to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Mujib. One of Allah's names is Al-Mujib. Al-Sami' The all-hearer, the responder. You are in a privileged place. When you are oppressed, you are in a privileged place. So take advantage of that time because you know that that is only a window. <laughs> Eventually, Allah will expose them and you got your haq back. You got your haq back. Once Allah exposes them, you got your haq back. Allah gave you your right back. So for the time that the lie is going on, for the time that the scandal is going on, you are in a privileged position. Call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during that time. Someone is lying on you. Someone is falsifying evidence against you. Someone is taking you to court. Someone is going to a shake about you. Someone is doing this about you. You know, sit in that discomfort. You are in a privileged place. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it hurts to know that people lying on you, people falsifying evidence against you, people, you know, creating videos about you. Yes, that hurt. It's painful. Nobody said being right does not come along with being in pain. Being right and being in pain are usually synonymous with one another. <laughs> How can pain go hand in hand? <laughs> How can pain go hand in hand? I mean, have we not lived long enough to see that? Truth and pain usually go hand in hand. They're usually synonymous with one another. You can't have one without the other. And you got to sit in that discomfort. But while you are in that place, you are privileged. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you. Allah sees you. Allah sees what they're doing. Allah sees what they're doing. Allah hears what they're saying. You don't think Allah hears you or sees you? Subhanallah. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, I was in the room when Khawla bint Tha'laba Mujadila, when she was complaining to the Prophet sallallahu about her husband. I was in the same room when she was complaining to the Prophet sallallahu about her husband. She said, and although I couldn't hear the entire conversation, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard the whole entire conversation from above the seven heavens. Aisha said, I was in the same room and I couldn't even hear the whole conversation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard the entire conversation from above the seven heavens. Allah revealed the whole entire surah named after her. The Mujadila. Surah to Mujadila is named after Khawla bint Tha'laba. Aisha said, I was in the same room and I couldn't even hear everything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above the seven heavens and he heard the whole entire conversation. Allah begins the surah. Qad sami Allahu qawla lati tujadiluka fi zawjiha wa tashtiki ila Allah. Allah has indeed heard the complaints of the woman who argues with you, O Muhammad, about her husband. So don't ever think, yes, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to sit in that place. But you are in a privileged place on, on the flip side of that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see that you're oppressed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, is going to respond. There's nothing that stops Allah from answering your, your dua. 
So hak and pain are usually synonymous with one another in those situations. And Ya'qub alayhi salam, he said, for sabrun jameel, I have no other recourse but to just exercise beautiful patience, meaning I will complain to no one, and if I do have to complain, I only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faqat, that's it. And complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not yanfi a sabr, it does not contradict patience. It does not contradict patience. Because you are complaining about the one subhanahu wa ta'ala, complaining to the one subhanahu wa ta'ala who can, who decreed the situation, number one, and number two, who has the power to lift the situation from you. Aisha said that I used to cry and go wake up and cry and go back to sleep and cry and go back to sleep. There was nothing that I can do until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah. <laughs> Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayats in Surah to Surah to Nur, Surah number 24, exonerating Aisha. And at that, mo at that moment, Allah restored her haq. Allah restored her haq. But in that moment, in those moments, you know, she had to be patient. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had to be patient. So your lesson number 16 is that everything that is done in the dark will eventually come to the light. What is done in the dark will always be brought to the light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, not only is he al-haq, not only is Allah the truth, Allah is al-nur, Allah is the light. <laughs> Go figure. Not only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-haq, not only is Allah the truth, but Allah is also al-nur. <laughs> Allah is the light. Allah is the light. SubhanAllah. And this is why Yaqub said, Sabarun Jamil, just a beautiful patience. I don't know all the facts. I know you guys are not telling the truth. I don't know all of the facts. But what I do know is that I'm going to exercise patience because what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said? An Nasr Ma Sabr. That with patience comes the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa'alam anna Nasr Ma Sabr. That know that with patience comes the help and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? That with patience comes the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And understand that notice he exemplified something the Prophet sallallahu taught to us. And that is that as-sabra in the sadamat al-ula. That patience is exerted. At the onset of the calamity, soon as the calamity strikes, you immediately remind yourself that I have to be patient. That doesn't mean don't go find out the facts. That doesn't mean like patience, much like dua, right? When we say I'm going to just make dua, okay, and then what? A lot of people say, I'm just going to pray on it. I'm just going to make dua. Okay, then what? What are you going to do afterwards? Because as far as I know, in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to execute and give you the dua that you asked for, you got to go out and seek it. You got to seek the means. Akhdu bil asbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just magically respond to you like that. He's going to facilitate what you ask for through the means that he has, you know, that you have to go out and seek. You supplicate, oh Allah, give me this and give me that. And now you go out in the world and you go seek those opportunities whereby you can earn the, the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, when you say, I'm just going to be patient. Be patient from an Islamic standpoint doesn't mean just sit back and do nothing. Being patient doesn't mean just sit back and do nothing. Sometimes when imams tell sisters, you know, sister, just be patient. That means to just go and sit on your hands and do nothing. No, that's not what it means. Yes, dua has a process and so does patience. Because as we're going to see that Prophet Yaqub, he went and sought the truth of the matter. He didn't just sit on his hands. He went and sought truth of the matter. Stop telling people to be patient. And think that that means to just go somewhere, sit in the corner on your hands and do nothing. That's not what patience means. Patience means stop complaining to people who can't help you. And complain in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moving on to the next ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are on, um, we're on uh, ayat number 19. Surah 12, 19. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَ دَلْوَى قَالَ يَا بُشْرَى هَذَا غُلَامٌ وَأَصَرُّهُ بِضَاعَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَنُونَ This is where the story kind of gets deep, man. It gets very interesting here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And then came a company of travelers. So now it flashes from the conversation with the brothers in Ya'qub, now flashes back to what's Yusuf doing, right? What's going on with Yusuf in the well? So now this seven-year-old boy is sitting in the belly of this well, in the, in the bottom of the well, right? No shirt on, cold, dark, no water, no food. Could be scorpions down there. Could be, you know, rats down there. Could be anything down there. Now Allah takes us back to what's going on with Yusuf. So he kind of rotates between the conversation between the sons and Yaqub and now going back to Yusuf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ So a caravan came by. And the beauty is that the scholars mentioned in Tafsir that this caravan was on its way to Egypt. And it got sidetracked. It lost its way. And in losing its way, this is how you this is how you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. In control. <laughs> this caravan was on its way to Egypt from Palestine. All of this is taking place in Palestine, right? Caravan is on its way from Palestine to Egypt, loses its direction, and ends up where this well is. Con coincidence? I think not. All within the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All within the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a coincidence at all. So the caravan loses its way and ends up where this well is. So the caravan, a group of people on this, on, this, on this trip, they send a couple of people to go and fetch water from the well. So it's a group of them, a couple of them, who go and get water from the well. He lowers the, the, the pail, the bucket, down into the well... And it hits Yusuf in the head. Yusuf grabs on to the string of the well and they begin pulling the, the string up. And here's this beautiful little boy. So they say, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, ya bushra hadha ghulam. They said, glad tidings, look at this little boy. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, pay attention. Then Allah says, وَأَسَرُّهُ بِضَاعَةً But they hid him. They hid Yusuf. They didn't tell the rest of the people in the caravan, hey, we got a little boy. They said, wow, look at this little boy. But then when they found him, they tucked him away. They hid him. They hid him. وَأَسَرُّهُ بِضَاعَةً They hid him so they could sell him as merchandise. They hid him as if he was merchandise. They saw him as a commodity. You understand? And Allah says, Wallahu alimun bima ya'malun. But Allah is well aware of what they were doing. Understand something. Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam, he never saw his son again for 40 years. Think about that. Can you imagine losing your son? Can you imagine losing your child? You don't know what's happened to them. No word, no nothing. Never heard from them again. He did not see his son again. Like, subhanAllah, man. La ilaha illallah. Prophet Yaqub did not see his son again for 40 years, man. The beauty in that is that he had the opportunity to see his son again. There's some people from amongst us, some of you guys listening right now, that you will never see your child again until Jannah. Some of you will never see your child again until paradise. Some of you will never see your child again into paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 52, for any of you who have ever lost a child, 
I know some of you personally, I'm not going to say your names, but you know that I know you personally and I know your story personally. You've ever lost a son, ever lost a daughter to murder, to anything. I want you to turn the sword number 52, I at 21 and rejoice. Rejoice. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And those of you who believe, those of you who believe, وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ And your children follow you in your faith. You raised your children to be Muslim. You raised your children on Tawheed. You raised your children to follow the path of Islam. But you lost them somewhere along the way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلْحَقَنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ We will reunite you with your children. Because it wouldn't be paradise for you. How would it be paradise for you to go to Jannah and enjoy all of the bliss in Jannah, and you never got a chance to see your child again. SubhanAllah. You never got a chance to see your kid again. It wouldn't be paradise. It wouldn't be Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and those who believe, whose descendants, their children, grandchildren, they followed you in your faith, we will reunite you with your children and we will not deprive them of anything of their good deeds. Every person, every individual will be held in pledge for his own deeds. Subhanallah, it wouldn't be paradise. If you went to Jannah, your child was murdered. And you never saw your child again. And then on day of judgment, you make it past the bridge. And you know, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. And Allah tell you to go to Jannah. And you never see your child again. It wouldn't be paradise. And that's for some of our children to understand. The fact that your parents made whatever sacrifices they made so that you were Muslim. It's not just the fact that your parents gave you Islam. But if your parents die on Islam, then on the strength that your parents are going to Jannah, you might actually go to Jannah. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might forgive you for your sins just on the strength that Allah wants to reunite you with your parents, even though you don't actually deserve to go to Jannah. Even though you don't deserve it, but it would be a punishment for your parents to go to Jannah without having the children along with them. So Allah allows you to go along with your parents into paradise as a mercy for your parents, not just for you. You understand? SubhanAllah. Yaqub never saw his son again for 40 years. Can you imagine? Think about how many kidnappings and things that went on in our society right before the coronavirus and now all of a sudden we don't hear anything about it. If you notice now all of a sudden we don't see any of the videos of Palestinians being brutalized by Israelis. You notice every Ramadan, right as Ramadan's coming in, we see all these videos surfacing on, on, on Twitter, uh, on Instagram, on Twitter, on, you know, of Israelis beating up and, you know, pulverizing, is you know, Palestinians or, you know, we, we don't see those videos anymore. All that we talk about is COVID-19. That's how you know. That's how you know this stuff is all an agenda. It's all agenda driven. All agenda driven. You don't see none of those videos. I haven't seen one video on Twitter of <laughs> Palestinians being brutalized, being you know tortured, being abused by Israelis. I haven't seen one video. Have you? And notice this was going on every Ramadan. At the beginning of every Ramadan, you see all of these videos surface. Why we don't see those videos? Because that's not part of the agenda right now. The agenda is COVID-19. But y'all don't want to hear that because y'all think it's just, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. You keep thinking that. <laughs> you keep thinking that. But it's not a coincidence. I mean, it's just a thought. A shea bishe youth call it. Just a thought I want you to think about. But Prophet Yaqub, he did not see his son again for another 40 years, man. 
for another 40 years, man, not knowing where your child is. I, I pray that no parent ever has to, ever has to experience that. Losing your child. It's one thing to that your child is murdered and you, you saw the body, you buried the body, you prayed over the body, plus, and now you got to just grieve and get over, get past that. But it's another thing to miss a child. There's no word on where the child is, that the child been found. You know what I mean? You haven't heard anything about this kid. And understand something. When they saw Yusuf, when they saw Yusuf, the thing you have to understand is the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Mararutu bi akhi Yusuf. The Prophet ﷺ said when he made he went on the night journey, right? You remember the night journey in the tenth year after he received revelation, after Khadija died, after his uncle Abu Talib died, as Khadija died a few days, like almost six days after Abu Talib. So he lost two valuable people back to back. He lost his uncle and then he turned around and he lost his wife, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet sallallahu from Mecca to Jerusalem and then up to the heavens. As he passed the different gates of the heavens, he met some of the different prophets and messengers. He said, Mararutu bi akhi Yusuf. He said, I pass by my brother Yusuf. He said, Fa'idha qad a'tahu Allahu shatr al jamal. He said, and when I looked at Yusuf, he said, for there was Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him half of the beauty of the world. Half of the beauty. So look at the world and everything and how beautiful the world is. This is only half of the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Prophet Yusuf. <laughs> subhanallah. Allah gave Yusuf half of the beauty of the world. He gave Yusuf half beauty and then he gave the rest of the beauty to the world. So when we marvel at, you know, oceans and springs and water, when a man sees a woman and she's gorgeous and beautiful, when a woman sees a man and he's drop dead gorgeous and handsome, all of that is just Half of the beauty that the other half of the beauty that Allah gave the world, the other half Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Prophet Yusuf. So when they pulled this boy out of the well <laughs> and they saw him, they laid eyes on this boy. They say, Yeah, Bushra had the ghulam. Glad tidings. Look at this beautiful little boy. And they tucked him away to the side as merchandise. And the scholars say it was here that they made the deal with the brothers. The brothers sold him. It was here when they tucked him away. They didn't let everybody else on the caravan know that they found a little boy in the well. They tucked him to the side. And it was there the brothers of Yusuf came out of nowhere and was like, that's our slave. We'll sell him and we'll get to that ayah. And they sold their own brother into slavery. They sold their own biological blood brother into slavery. And some of us do that with our siblings as well. We sell you up the river for nothing. We do it to one another as Muslim brothers and sisters. We'll sell you up the river. Oh, guess what so-and-so said? Oh, really? He said that? And then, you know, off it goes into the internet just for likes and retweets. And, and what was it all worth? When you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will it all be worth? You share something that you saw on somebody's page. You share some information that came to you that you never even verified. And you share, you run and you share that on Facebook. You run and share that on Twitter. You run and share that on Instagram for a few likes. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودًا They sold him for a cheap price. They sold him for 20 dirhams. 20 silver pieces. Why 20? Because it was 10 brothers and each one of them would get two. For two dirhams? That's what you sold your brother for? And some of us will sell one another up the river on the internet for likes and retweets for a cheap price. That's all you wanted out of this? You expose me, you put my information on blast just for a couple of retweets and a couple of re-likes and reposts. Be darahim ma'aduda. Be feminine baksin for a cheap price, a few measly, you know, coins. And that's what we do to one another. We'll sell you up the river, right? 
Oprah Winfrey's sister went and did an interview about Oprah having a child when she was a kid because she was raped and she was pregnant and she, you know, discarded the child or whatever she did with the child. Her sister went and did an interview. I forgot how many thousands of dollars they paid her. Until this day, Oprah Winfrey doesn't speak to her sister. It's just like, damn, like you would do that just for a few dollars? You would give them an exclusive about my own personal life just for a few dollars? We do it every day. <laughs> we do it every single day. Instagram, you're going to cut off. I'll turn you back on, inshallah. We do it every day. We'll sell you up the river for nothing. All right, it's, it's, we 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 got a we got a real situation, man, in our culture. We have a real situation in our culture, man. You know, we, we'll sell one another, you know, as the brothers did with Yusuf, for just a few coins. So they sold Yusuf into slavery for 20 dirhams, 20 silver coins. So each one of them could get two coins. That's all you wanted out of the deal? Your brother, you know, your brother wasn't worth more than that? Your brother wasn't worth more than that? Just a few likes. You you want to be popular on the internet. So you go and you find out something about this person who you never even verified whether it was true or not. And you go and you expose that to the world on Twitter, or on Facebook, or on Instagram. Just because what are you getting out of it? Other than just, you know, your five minutes of fame. You know, that's all it is. You get your five minutes of fame. And then you, you know, and then you dwindle away just like everybody else. You get it. You got a couple of likes. That post was hot. How long is the post going to be hot? Three days? This is a fast-paced society, so stuff die out very quickly. <laughs> but you would do that. You would sell your brother up the river just for a couple of likes and reposts and retweets. That's all it was worth. And then when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will it be worth then? What will it be worth? The next time you decide on exposing somebody, and I'm not, and there's some people who really do deserve to be exposed. But I'm talking about the backbiting and the slandering. I mean, we got to really take a look at that. Is it worth it? Is it really worth it? Are you really, are you really ready to sacrifice your hereafter just for a, a few likes and posts and retweets from complete strangers who if you died today, they wouldn't even show up at your janazah? Is it really worth it? But when they saw Yusuf, he was beautiful. And they saw him, they saw his commodity before they saw his humanity. They never asked Yusuf, where's your father? <laughs> you understand? They never did what human beings normally do, right? They exploited him. They say, yeah, Bushra had a ghulam wa asarruhu bida'ah. And they tucked him away to the side as, a, as merchandise. They never said to him, where's your father? Where's your parents? How did you end up down here? They saw his commodity before they saw his humanity. And we have to be mindful that there are people in our lives right now who do the same thing to us right now. They don't give a damn about you, how much you're hurting, what you are going through, what you are experiencing. They could give a damn about any of that. All they care about is what they can get from you. All they care about is what they can get from you. Sociopathic behavior. We are sociopaths at best. We don't give a damn about anybody. All we care about is what we can get from you. They saw Yusuf's commodity before they saw his humanity. They never said, hey, little man, how'd you end up here? Where's your parents? You're sitting in a well, in the bottom of a well with no shirt on, beat up, bruised, nothing. They never offered any water, never offered any help, never offered anything. Just tuck him away because we're going to make some money off of him. You understand? We're going to make some money off of him. Right? And some people do the same thing with, in their relationships with other people. Some people are your friends right now, not because they actually give a damn about you, but what you can do for them. You want to see who's your friend? Tell them no. 
Tell them no and see if they come back. All you got to do is tell them no and see if they come back. Because a person's not your friend. The moment you tell them no, they blow it up out of proportion. Oh, you said no. And how many times I've done this for you? And look at what I've done for you. And look at what this happened. And uh, uh. That person is not your friend. That person was only associating with you because of what they could get from you. And the moment they found out they could no longer get anything from you, they washed their hands of you and it's off to the next person. Off to the next person. You understand? Sometimes this happened even between husband and wife. <laughs> husband and wife. Husband is just draining her for all he can drain her for. He going to build himself up. Pouring from her cup into his cup, building himself up. And then once he realizes there's no more use for you, I want another wife. And when you ain't cool with that, then you can bounce because I'm going to have my cake and I'm going to eat it too. You understand? <laughs> I'm going to drain you from, I'm going to stick a straw in you and I'm going to suck the life out of you. And then when there's nothing left of you, then, you know, it's off to the next person. And we got to take responsibility for that in the Muslim community because we've created that environment. The fake friendships, the fake handshakes, the fake smile, the fake salam, salam alaikum, all of this fake stuff that we have brought into the religion. We just don't know how to be genuine. I don't really like you, but that doesn't stop me from giving you the salams. I got to give you your, your rights. You're my brother. You're my sister in Islam. I love you for the pleasure of Allah. I just don't like you personally. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't like you personally. There were people that the Prophet Sallallahu did not like personally. But he still engaged them. He still gave them the salams and he still treated them like a Muslim. Your feelings, you are entitled to your feelings. But Islam dictates your behavior. It's, you are entitled to your feelings. You don't have to like me. But you do have to treat me according to the way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and mandated that you treat me and how the Prophet Sallallahu demonstrated that treatment should be, you know, should be exemplified. You are entitled to your feelings. Nobody can tell you you're not supposed to like this person. Not supposed. Those are your feelings. You're entitled to that. You are entitled to your feelings. But Islam dictates your behavior. But they never cared about Yusuf. They never said, you know, how did you end up here? Where's your parents? You know, nothing. Nah. Nah. Oh, we're going to tuck you away to the side because we can make some money off of you. They saw his commodity before they saw his humanity. All right. Um, inshallah, we're we, we going to stop here. Um, I think I've, I've kind of given you guys a little bit, a little too much for today, inshallah, Tada. Uh, so we'll continue. Uh, we'll continue on Monday, inshallah. Um, we'll start at 630, inshallah, on Monday. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, you guys have been great. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Um, hopefully, um, this lesson was just as good as the next lesson, uh, as the previous lessons. And as we move forward, inshallah, I'm hoping that you guys are jotting down, you know, all of the lessons that we have covered. If it would be a great help if one of you, one of you or multiple uh, multitudes of you could jot down or itemize all of the lessons all of the lessons and then post it and make it available so that everyone will have all of the lessons in one place. All right. Some people are not as good, not as savvy with the pen or not as savvy with the computer as other people. And it would be a sadaqah, a great sadaqah if you would be able to, you know, if you would be able to itemize all of the, the lessons, inshallah, and where the lessons came from, all right? Not just the lesson, because if the person can't make the connection with the lessons, then it's, 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 it's useless. I want you to itemize the lessons, and then I want you to point to where those lessons were drawn from, all right? Where the lessons were drawn from. Um, so please, if someone can do that, and then, you know, posted or tag me in inshallah ta'ala that would be great if you guys could you know if you have notebooks and you have written your notes man share your notes man i, I would love to see what your notes look like uh, as you can see my my notebook here like all of my notes are here i'm a mess with my notes but uh they work for me they're my notes after i'm dead and gone my children are gonna have hell trying to read through my material and understand my thought process but it works for me 
all right? But I would love to see you guys, you know, post your notes. So if you took notes today or the day before, take a screenshot of your notes and, and share your notes, man, so that other people can benefit from that. Other people can benefit. You can't imagine how many people are not as good, you know, writing and taking down notes. Everybody is not great at that, all right? But then there's some of you guys who are, you know, who are awesome with that. Uh, inshallah to Adam. جزاكم الله خيرا I'll see you guys on Monday وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته